Beautiful machine. That was going to go badly. <laughs> What's that? Uh, so actually, it does that. Um, David, who is in our lab, actually uh, wrote a program that in fact, at the major robotics conference, <clears throat> you could, it would take a picture of you, turn it into a silhouette, and it would draw your picture on a board, and you could take it home with you, yeah? All right. All right, 235, welcome everybody. This is Underactuated Robotics. I hope you're in the right place. Um, we're gonna talk about things like walking robots in the class, right? So, <clears throat> uh, I wanna give you an overview of the class and give you some of, uh, by the end of the class, you should at least know what underactuated means. That's sort of a, you know, a checkpoint. If, uh, if you don't know that, then I've failed. Uh, but I also wanna dig in a little bit to robot dynamics and uh, you know, show you some of the math we're gonna use throughout the course, and just even the philosophy of the course, as well as getting some of those definitions across. So, uh, just the administrative stuff quickly. So I'm Russ, um, Jayun is not here today. Sava's here, maybe stand up Sava. Uh, and Pete is also here, right here. I think we have an excellent teaching staff this time. Um, most of the information is all on the website. The the Book is the website, and from the book you can you'll click a link and you can see the, the specific to this semester information for the website. We have our email at underactuated staff. If you haven't found it your way to the website already, um, you know, please sign up for Piazza. That's the one action item. The link is on the website. It's also on the slide if you figured out how to get to slides.com um, <clears throat> and watch this if you want to you know watch along. Uh, you can use slides.com to watch along too. Okay, yeah, so the, the textbook looks something like this. Some of you took manipulation with me last term. Um, <clears throat> so it's meant to be, it's a, I decided to write the notes in HTML because PDF just couldn't handle all the robot videos and the interactive visualizations and other things that I was trying to put into the content. <clears throat> Some features just to point out, um, almost every chapter has a, a link to DeepNote, so you, as you can follow along by sort of running the code that goes along with the example. That's just an online, if you've used Google Colab, it's a lot like Google Colab. It supports the class a little better. This here is the link that goes to the course website, a course being taught at MIT, so that's gonna be this year. Our goal is to put all the videos onto YouTube. They're gonna be immediately on Panopto, so if you wanted to you know, watch live from home or watch it immediately, then you could watch it on Panopto, but it'll be posted on YouTube a day or two later after we, we just have to do a, med, a minor, minor editing step. Quincy knows that, that well, he, it was, he, he carried the weight last semester to do that. Uh, okay, and the other thing is there's um, like random highlights you'll see, okay? Someone highlighted and said, hey, I'm from Michigan too, uh, that's cool. Um, but it's meant for um, you know, highlighting and asking technical questions uh, also, right? Uh, so this is a, sort of an online living Google Doc kind of thing. If you have a question, something that's not clear about the notes, feel free to just 
highlight, ask a question, uh, and I will try to answer. That's one of many places you can try to get a hold of me and the staff to ask questions. And you'll see lots of people have asked questions um, over the years, and, and that's fun. And then um, you can actually also, if you want to use that, if you find that useful, you can make an account and make a private posting for yourself and just keep your notes there too. I'm not sure if that's useful or not. Good. And then, um, you know, the course website has the administrative details for this. I won't hand out paper, and we stopped doing that a while ago, but um, we're, our, all of the office hours, everything will be found there. One thing I want to explain, because I'm trying it a little differently this time, the grading distribution. Um, we're going to do something I've heard has worked well in other venues. Okay, So you will automatically, whatever is best for your grade, be graded in one of two ways. One of them has an attendance per and participation 5%. Okay, So if you're here and you're participating and you're asking questions on Piazza, then, um, then you'll get that 5%. If you think you just know the material, you don't need it, then you, don't, you can just put that 5% into the midterm, right? So if you feel like I, could, I aced the midterm, I don't need to sit in class, fine. You don't have to sit in class, and, uh, and, and that's, that's the trade-off. I've heard that's pretty good. I appreciate your feedback if you guys hate that or love that. Um, but that's something I've heard has worked well in a few cl other classes. And all of our other um, you know, policies about collaboration, about generative AI, all, these, all the standard things are on the website. So please take a look. OK, so uh, let's start to dig in. The first thing I want to make sure I say again and again is that robots are awesome. You are living in the best possible time to be thinking about robotics. They have, we are in the golden age of robotics, right? The fact that uh, you can just walk around campus and see these things walking around, right? Um, and it, it's not the exception anymore. There's been a massive proliferation of beautiful robot hardware. Companies that are building hardware, trying to build an entire ecosystem around this hardware. It's, uh, it's I've never seen such an exciting time. The, the entry, of course, of, well, first computer vision started working. That made a lot of things possible. Large language models came on the scene. That's awesome. Suddenly we can ask, we can start you know, asking, how do I make a pizza? Give me step-by-step -step instructions. Tell me how my robot should make a pizza, right? That's amazing. And you know, the foundation model philosophy of GPT, for instance, is coming into robotics pretty fast. Okay? So you're living in a beautiful time to be playing with robots. Uh, Right, so what is this class about? Roughly, this class is about making Atlas dance. Ah, it's a little bit more than that, but it, there's, that's kind of a theme, is that we're going to try to understand the math behind this, because it's a very general recipe um, for, for making robots do things like this. Okay? Uh, it's like sort of awesome for me over the years to have been working on this and just you know, watch these things come to life. It's just incredible. Right? This is you know, Atlas doing parkour. You've probably all seen this if you decided to take the class. But the, the capabilities of this hardware, of the software, are just like absolutely phenomenal. And there's a lot that goes on be behind them. And there's a lot of things we can do to make it better still. So by the end of the class, you should roughly be understanding what's happening in these amazing videos. Okay. But that's not the only, so, so the Atlas control system is almost sort of famously now, it doesn't use much learning, okay? It uses learning for perception, but it's got a, it uses equations of motion from, from Newton to do a lot of the plan, online planning. You know, contrast that with uh, Animal and a lot of the quadrupeds these days. Spot is a mix, I would say, these days. Um, they're using a lot more learning, right? So this is sort of the reinforcement learning uh, success story of the last few years, and now it's spread to we see lots and lots of quadrupeds using similarly successful reinforcement learning pipelines. And in other areas, um, for instance, when you get to some dexterous manipulation, there's other types of learning that are working well, right? So imitation learning in this particular example is you're we're watching robots that can do, I'd say, surprisingly dexterous things with their hands, like spreading peanut butter on toast and peeling potatoes and turning the pages of a book, right? 
These are things that just weren't possible a few years ago, and uh, you know, we're gonna try to understand a bit about what makes those things tick. This is actually the, my favorite version of that, right? So this is, um, the robot was trained to like a particular page of the book, okay? Which it knows by its picture, and if you flip the pages of the book, it'll flip the pages back. That's all it does all day long. If you flip the pages, it'll flip it back. But it has, you know, it has the understanding that if it sees a particular picture, that was to the left and I should flip this way. And if it was, sees a different picture, that was to the right and I should flip the other way, right? And it does the task pretty reliably. And it's a non-trivial dynamics and control problem, okay? So <clears throat> the goals for the course, is that, is the spot too loud? Slightly easier for me to leave it on, but if it's loud, I can turn it off. It's fine? Okay. Um, so the goals for the course, and if you've taken manipulation, you, you'll see this is a fairly different set of goals, but we're going to talk a lot about dynamics, okay? Dynamics and control. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about optimization. We talk about some types of optimization in, in the manipulation class, but we get much more into some of the details of, of convex optimization and how it applies to dynamical systems in this class. If you've taken classes on control, this will complement those, but this is gonna give you the nonlinear control and the optimization-based view of control, and then the machine learning view of control, right? So this is about dynamical systems control uh, achieved through optimization and machine learning. The way I try to go through that um, I really try to capture sort of in each, uh, you know, in each sort of, when we introduce a new algorithm, we try to um, do rigorous thinking about a model system. So for instance, when we introduce walking robots, you'll see that we can actually introduce extremely simple walking robot con models. Starts off actually with a rimless wheel as the simplest model of walking. And then I can add a two link walker and a three link walker, okay? We'll be able to derive the equations of motion. We'll be able to understand, to some extent, their nonlinear dynamics. They're gonna have stable limit cycles. They're gonna have hybrid impacts when the foot hits the ground, okay? We're gonna be able to understand that. And then we're gonna think about how to design control systems that can increase the stability of the region of, you know, increase the region of attraction of a limit cycle. These are the kind of tools we'll be developing, okay? And you'll have a toolbox of, of algorithms from optimization and, and learning when you're done. I get a lot of questions about what do you need to, to have to take the class, okay? Um, and I, it's, it's a little bit tricky in the sense that I try to make the class accessible to course six, course two, course 16, those are the dominant. We have some NIH folks. Um, and that is explicitly the goal of the class is to be able to teach some dynamics and control to maybe people that have thought more about software in their life and to bring in some optimization and, and learning to people that have maybe thought a little bit more about dynamics. So because of that, I try to bring in, uh, I try to not make a lot of prerequisites on either side. But that does not mean it's an easy class. Uh, we actually, we use linear algebra heavily, DiffEQ heavily. When people feel behind, it's typically because they're not comfortable with the sort of, they don't have the, maybe the maturity of the basic linear algebra DiffEQ sort of tools. Okay, we use Python heavily. That's gonna be important, okay? And I do use, so I don't assume you've taken a machine learning class, okay? But I do, I will introduce neural network jargon, right, uh, as we go. So if you have a comfort with using PyTorch and the like, then uh, that would be great. If not, you'll, I'll try to keep links to, to sort of uh, drop in some of that language as I introduce it. Okay, uh, I would say that, th yeah. Of these things that I try to not assume you have, I think at the end of the term, the way the people that most wish they studied something, it would probably be optimization. There's so much you can know about optimization, and I can only introduce so much of it in the class. So um, that's one place if you're gonna spend a little you know, time studying on the side, I would, I would probably grab a book on optimization, and there's some references on the website. Okay, so let's, let's dig in a little bit. So, I said it quickly, but I like kind of putting up those three examples, right? So, right now, Atlas, which is the Boston Dynamics humanoid, 
is mostly using online planning, okay, with models from mechanics. So it's a sort of mechanics plus optimization. Animal, okay, and I think a lot of quadrupeds, and this is true of a lot of, of bipeds. If you watch uh, Tesla's biped walking around, uh, and you've watched enough walking robots for it, that's not an RL policy, that's a, a ZMP policy of walking that, that thing around. I don't know that, I don't have any inside information, I'm just saying that's what it looks like to me, right? Animal and most quadrupeds these days, they started off and a lot of them have a, an underlying controller. Spot's main controller is gonna be a lot like Atlas's main controller, okay? But we've seen a lot of movement towards reinforcement learning. As a successful strategy for handing, handling quadrupeds, especially when the terrain gets dicey and it's closer to the limits of performance, okay? And they're dealing with a lot of uncertainty in the world. And then manipulation, this is a gross oversimplification of a complicated dynamic field, but I would say the thing that's kind of winning right now in manipulation is imitation learning, okay? So it's interesting, yeah, go ahead. Right? Yeah. I mean, so, so I, in some sense, I'm going to give you a semester-long answer to that question. Okay? So um, there are definitely examples of reinforcement learning for bipeds, okay? But bipeds fall, off, fall over more, more easily. There's also another subtle thing, which is um, quadrupeds are easier to simulate, okay? Point contact uh, on the ground is actually a pretty easy thing to, to simulate. Simulate fast, right? So that, that w plays strongly to the RL workflow. Um, in, uh, in quadrupeds are sort of inherently stable. Uh, if you have, especially, <clears throat> if you look at a quadruped that was built uh, 10 years ago or more, they were built very differently than the quadrupeds you see today from, from BD and Unitry and the others, okay? Uh, what you see of these is they have very light distal mass, so, so very light legs and pretty big actuators at the hip. So quadrupeds can basically not, you know, you can, uh, you can almost never fall down in a free, in an open environment, if you can move your leg arbitrarily fast. So what happened is I think the actuators got fast enough that robots are, got very stable, and then you can start exploring the boundaries of your performance much more quickly. It's harder to get a humanoid to have super fast leg dynamics, okay? Not impossible, some of the dynamics, you'll see some very low distal mass bipeds too, but kinematically they tend to be different, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk, so there's a lot of trajectory optimization, okay, that happens on this, and that'll be a, one of the main topics in the course. So I, I, I actually, that, the reason I put this up is not because I expect you to know the details of imitation learning or, or reinforcement learning yet, but just to say that there's subtle reasons that underlie some of these things, okay, and by the end of the course, you should really understand, I think, some of the subtle reasons why these are the, the current state of the art, and it'll change maybe next time I teach the class, okay? But things like this that we were just talking about, those are some subtle points about what works well for simulation, you know, what, um, that we want to get to the heart of, okay? And the other point I want to make here is that people often ask, and I, you know, I've been on panels at conferences or whatever where they say, you know, which is better, mechanics or reinforcement learning, or reinforcement learning or imitation learning, okay? Uh, this is sort of, you know, physics-based models versus pure learning, for instance. There's a lot of, like, this versus this. And if you take away something from the, the whole semester, I want you to think that these things are actually a lot more similar than they are different. Really, there's a mechanical system that's under test, okay? That's the, the object of study is the, is the physics that we have that underlie our robot. There's an optimization problem that we're trying to solve. It can be described in terms of imitating a human or in terms of a cost function, okay? And we have many different ways to sort of optimize that function, okay? These are slightly different preferences 
on the way you do that optimization. They give you a slightly different vocabulary for what you, what's easy or hard in that optimization. But the crux of the class is understanding the optimization landscape and maybe why you would use one of these tools versus another. Okay? But to do that really well, you have to dig, dig into the detail. I'm going to stop the robot. It's a little noisy for me. Okay, so let me say a similar thing a slightly different way, okay? Um, if you've seen a reinforcement learning talk or read a reinforcement learning book, there's a diagram that everybody always makes. We have an environment. This is also, the, this is like the robot is included in the environment, okay? Conceptually, the outputs of that environment are the observations that we get to make. Okay, so in the examples that we'll use in the class, the observations might be joint uh, position measurements, velocity measurements. It could also be cameras, torque sensors, contact load sensors, okay? On the other side, you have your actions coming in. And this can be, for instance, motor torque commands, or other actuator commands if you have different, something other, different on your robot. <clears throat> okay, and our goal is to build a controller. I guess the RL folks would call it a policy. I call it a policy too, it's all good. Um, synonym for that would be a controller, okay? That's doing sort of the, the other half of that feedback loop, right? By the way, um, the controller, you know, is, this is the, maybe the control's name for it, okay? Policy sometimes too. The control's name for this is the plant, which is because control theory is old, and it used to be we studied chemical plants, okay? But I will it is impossible for me to not say plant almost all the time, okay? So when I say plant, that's the robot or the environment under test, okay? Now you can do different, um, you know, it might be that we, we include the low-level controller that's running in the driver of spot inside this box or outside this box. There's different modeling choices that could define that boundary slightly differently, but this is sort of the, the big abstraction that everybody talks about in control and in reinforcement learning <coughs> and in imitation learning. Now, a lot of the learning-based class, if you're, take a, if you're taking an RL class, for instance, <coughs> we would try to make very few assumptions about the, the equations that are underlying that. This is the, the, in some sense, the strength of reinforcement learning is that it's very general. The environment could be the game of Go, or it could be an Atari game, or it could be Dota or something, or it could be a robot. Right? And the same algorithms should work in all of those settings, roughly. But this is not that class. This is a different class, okay? We're gonna try to open up the box. We're gonna say, I care, I don't, I mean, I, not that I don't care about Go, I didn't mean to say that, but, but I, I care mostly about robots, okay? So I wanna look about the specific things that happen inside here when the, the environment is given by the dynamics of, mechan of Newton, right? Of, of Lagrange, right? I want to I want to understand specifically when it's a robot under there, and the the equations are structured, right? Energy is conserved, you know, all all the, all the types of things we know about mechanics, and we'll continue to to learn about mechanics, okay? And that changes the optimization landscape. Partly, it, I can often write much stronger algorithms than a general purpose. If I make no assumptions about this then I'm limited in what algorithms I can, I can use. If I open it up and try to exploit the structure of the equations, I can write stronger optimizations, and I can write stronger guarantees. And even when I go back and want to have a general algorithm that works for everything, I can understand it maybe more rigorously by having examined it closely on an important class of problems. Okay? So the class here, compared to a typical RL or learning control kind of class, really emphasizes a lot about the dynamics. Um, and the implications that has. 
Any questions about that? Didn't actually get as quiet as I hoped it would get. I think there's a harder off I can try. Motor power is cut. I'll disconnect. Good boy. <laughs> okay, so um, different robots, different um, tasks that we might try to, to make our robot do are going to have different complexity in the optimization problem. Okay, sometimes it's easy to write a control system for some robots. Some robots, it's very hard to write a control system. It's going to be similar when we're trying to use learning to do this, okay? There's sort of a complexity class, if you will. It's not as neat as in theory of computation, okay? But it, there's sort of a sense for, there's some things about your robot that can make it easier or harder to write a control system for. Okay, so some examples, for instance, um, if you have, so maybe I'll, I'll call this what makes control Challenging or difficult, okay. Rich, just keep more positive, okay. If your observations are very noisy, or if you're, they are um, insufficient, right? Uh, so if you have a lot of uncertainty or partial observability, if you are trying to, to you know, solve a problem and you, you're equipped with um, sensors that only give you a partial view of what's happening, okay, that's one thing that can make the control problem a lot more difficult or more rich. There's another thing, which is there's a property of the dynamics that can make things more rich. Okay, If your actions have long-term consequences, an example of that. If I were to you know, chuck this chalk, right? I took an action here, but the chalk's going to keep going no matter what I do on the next time step, right? So I have long-term consequences of, of the actions I took at the early time step. So, <clears throat> and if you've taken a class on sort of linear feedback control or something, you know, these are the questions about observability, and these are the questions about controllability, for instance. And we'll have nonlinear generalizations of those. We'll define those carefully later. Okay. Um, if your dynamics or observations are nonlinear, that can make things more rich than uh, than linear. Of course, it's funny. I used to always emphasize dimensionality. Like I used to say high dimensional here, but. That hurts some methods, not all methods. You know, learning has really uh, changed the perspective on what it means to be high dimensional. Right? Some things actually get easier again in very high dimensions. Okay. But for some of our algorithms, dimensionality will be a, a, a challenge if it gets too high dimensional. So these two are sort of the topics that we're, we're not going to talk as much about partial observability. There's good classes on state estimation and perception uh, on campus, okay? But we're going to talk a lot about these uh, dynamics aspects. Yes? Yep, good. So the simplest one that, that where the scaling works is it will typically have a state space representation of what's happening in here, and the number of states in the model is what blows things up. That often correlates with high actions, high observations, and stuff like this. Those complicate things in a different way, but I think the fundamental one is the state dimension. I love questions, by the way, so feel free to question anything. Okay, so that's a very abstract. Let's start using some of the sort of equations and machinery that we're going to use in the class. OK, 
Okay, we're going to be working a, a lot with differential equations. In particular, we're going to be working a lot with nonlinear differential equations. Unlike linear differential equations, although there are some specific cases where you can solve them analytically, our tools are mostly going to be numerical. So if you think, ah, I, I haven't solved a nonlinear differential equation for a long time, Nobody has. It's, uh, uh, don't worry. That, that's not the prerequisite. There's very few that you can solve. Okay. But the language of differential equations is something that you'll get reminded of quickly uh, and hopefully you have some background in. Okay. So um, I'll write a lot of equations that sort of take a form like this. This would be my state vector. This would be my control input. All of these are vectors, okay? So this is a a vector equation, a vector valued function, right? You give me a vector x in, a vector u in, and I'll compute f and I get a vector out. That vector is the time derivative. So when I write x dot, right, I think most people have seen it, but that's like d dt of x, right? The time derivative of x. This equation we'll often refer to as our dynamics model. We will spend a lot of time on the dynamics part of it. Later we'll add an, an observation model that might look like this, for instance, would be the simple, simplest form. Where y is the um, vector of observations. Okay, so um, <clears throat> if you've taken your differential equations class, then the, a simple form of this you've probably seen is a linear differential equation, which is just a specific example of that, a particular choice of f. I could say I could restrict f to be linear equations like this. This would be a linear input differential equation, right? a driven linear one. You might have seen these in 1803, or if you've taken a signals and systems class or a feedback control class, that's the, the standard stuff of, the, of those classes. Our focus is um, on these equations, but we're going to typically not be able to get away with linear differential equations. They're going to be nonlinear, and they're going to be nonlinear in a particular form, right? We care a lot about mechanics. First of all, they're, they're second order by nature, okay? Right? Newton told us it was F equals MA, which is an acceleration. So that means <clears throat> I'll write a version of this. I'll, we'll often write qu equations that look like this. So this. The acceleration is a function, is a vector function of my current positions and velocities. Okay, so Q would be, let's say, the generalized positions. So this could be, for instance, the joint angles of my robot. So if you give me a scalar number for each joint on spot. That could be, I stack them into a vector. That could be my Q. The joint velocities, Q dot. So my action input, which could be a, a motor torques, for instance, that should determine my acceleration. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, you should see that this is just a general, uh, or, uh, sorry, a more specific version of this. I could always write this in the more general form by just taking choosing to stack Q 
and q dot into a vector, and then I would be able to say x dot equals, I'll call it maybe f bar of x, just to have a different x, u, which would be q dot, and then this f, q, q dot, u, right? Yes? Q is the joint angles, the generalized positions. This would be my, my list of joint angles. This would be joint velocities, joint accelerations, let's say. So when we're going to see a couple examples of like pendulums and the like that subscribe to this form, and you'll see that Q is exactly the joint angles of a double pendulum, for instance. Okay, so these are the sort of um, structures, equations that we're going to work with a lot. But again, like I said, we're going to dig in and try to leverage specific structure of the robot equations, mechanics. So I'll do that in, in steps here. The first thing is, okay, we said it's second order, good. It's actually even more, it turns out the way that u enters into the equations is limited, okay? It turns out for basically every mechanics model, if u is a torque, okay, then I could actually write it in a slightly more specific form. Okay? So this is just, that's even more specific than that. It says I have to be able to write this in a way that u only enters in an affine way. Okay, affine because if I were to set q and q dot, then the dependence of this on u is just a linear function of u, if, if these two are given, plus a constant. So linear plus a offset, that's affine. So these are called control affine. Nonlinear systems. And we're going to see it has even more structure than that, but this structure is enough for me to give you an easy definition of underactuator. Okay? So I had to work up to that at least. Okay, let me give you the definition here. I'll do it. First, uh, a system, let me call this like equation one or something, okay, or system one. That thing is fully actuated in the state q, q dot, if and only if f2, q, q dot, this is a matrix, okay? It maps a vector to another vector, a matrix, okay? If this thing is full row rank. That seems a little specific pretty fast, Russ. What did you just do there, right? But, uh, but that is actually a very useful definition. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to argue that that is the thing that uh, sort of makes control interesting. When this fails, control gets a lot more interesting. Okay? If this is full row rank, then it has a right inverse. That's the, that's the key observation. If F2 is invertible in the way we want it to be invertible, then that's a much easier case for control than if it's not invertible. Because I'm gonna be able to basically pick a U to do to make the robot do whatever I want. Yes. Oh, good. So I'm just tell I'm this is you have to take it on faith. I haven't derived that. I'm saying we're gonna see a lot of robots and they're all gonna I'm gonna be able to write them in this form. Yep. Which is a more specific form than that. It's a property of Lagrangian mechanics. If torque is an input, then it turns out that the, the equations of motion are going to be linear in that torque input. 
Yeah, that's good. Um, when we actually, when Michael and I, uh, we used to work with, to get with the same person before. So, um, but uh, a long time ago, we debated and tried to look through if there was a really accepted general definition, and uh, it was a little messy. We've got one. I've got, I put one in the notes that we're, that everybody's been happy with. Yes. So I, I think it roughly goes with if you take the first derivative of the highest order, basically take a linearization of this for a nonlinear system then you can define underactuated in that way. And I, I've never found a system that I was unhappy with that definition. Yep. But the, you know, all of our systems are, for the class are gonna fit this form, yes? No, that's a, that's a great question. Is, the question was, is fully actuated the same as fully controllable? You can be um, underactuated, but controllable. In fact, that's the interesting case. Controllability in the linear systems case means it might it might take time to achieve a goal. You can't do it instantaneously, but you can use torque over time to achieve the goal. This is a question about can you instantaneously cause an acceleration? Let me just make sure this is um, clear. So if I have dimension of Q is We'll define that to be M, and dimension of U is N. Then F2 is a matrix, right? F2, given a Q and Q dot, this thing, U is, a, is N, Q double dot is M, so this must be a matrix that's sized M by N. So to say it's full row rank, what I mean is the rank of this, of that matrix, given a Q and a Q dot, equals M. Okay. That can only happen if N is at least as big as M. If it's a short fat matrix, it can't be full row rank. But if you have lots, if you have a big N, you can you can have, uh, you know, the, the rank of your number of rows that might be less than the number of columns. Yeah. That's a, that we're going to handle that separately. There's a, there's a separate case of if U has got limits for on it, for instance, we're going to handle that separately. Good question. Let's just take this as arbitrary U for now. Okay. So the rank of that matrix cannot be more than M. It cannot be more than N either, right? Um, it's underactuated. If the rank of F2, Q, Q dot is less than M. So I, I, I kind of got to, to pick this myself, maybe, but fully actuated is not really a word. Okay, it's not clear if underactuated is a word, but I just said, "Come on, I'm going to name the book after it." I'm going to so there's no hyphen in underactuated, okay, uh, or or anything. I, I called that one word, and we're going to just run with that. Yes. Oh no, sorry, that's a one. That was me like uh, auto completing from using GPT to write the. Or, yeah, that was your question? Okay, good. That's still one. Thank you. Yes? In both cases, yeah, so in Q, Q dot. Thank you. In both cases, it's a condition that depends on your current position and state. But, okay, for many systems, These properties hold for all Q or Q dot. Which we would call the system is underactuated. Yeah? It's, 
the fully actuated one is actually a little bit hard. Um, you will call a fully actuated system even if there are some singular configurations that make it drop rank. But certainly for underactuated, we'd say it's underactuated if for all Q and Q dot. This is true. Yes. Yes. Sorry. What? Uh, this is no, this is saying I'm going to call the system the the the, the equation underactuated in a particular Q and Q dot. If for that particular one the rank is low. And if all, for all Q, I'm going to call the system, not the state, under actuated. Yeah. Um, you can come up with quirky ones, but I think the, but by and large, we're going to see it's going to hold from for almost all. And you can have systems that latch or clutch or other things that can somehow lose a degree of freedom or gain a degree of freedom. Those are the, the ones you turn to. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me try to convince you then that, I mean, I, I think it's sort of clear, but let me just kind of make the point. If this matrix is invertible, and right inverse is what we need, that's why we need the, the row rank, the full row rank, okay? then control is easy. So let's make that super clear, right? So the name for this is feedback equivalence. Okay, if you give me um, a second order system that takes that form, And if you tell me, I'd like to achieve a certain acceleration, okay, then I can always apply a control input. If I write my controller to be the function F2 inverse, right inverse, times Q double dot D, and I'll subtract this one, F Q Q dot. This would be like, the, you know, this is what the, the, the world gave me. I'm going to type this into my controller. I have to assume that I know F1 and F2. We'll, re we'll relax that assumption later in the class. Okay, let's just assume we have a perfect knowledge of the dynamics. And here's something you could type into your controller. As long as that inverse ex exists, what does it do? If I put this u up here, f2 cancels this f2. I get a q double dot plus minus this. This term cancels that term. And the result is that I can follow exactly the acceleration that I wanted. You give me any acceleration, I can tell you the u that should, that's, that's what you'd expect just when I said that was invertible, right? You give me an acceleration, I can give you a U. Yeah. There's it, so, okay, good. So what this means is that we are now feedback equivalent to a double integrator. So I can basically think of my system as just being this system. And you still have to sort of take actions over time to get to the, to the origin in that system, but we know everything about how to control that system. Okay. It's called the double integrator. why it's feedback equivalent. So basically, you give me any robot, you put enough motors on it, and the dynamics of the robot sort of don't matter. If you're willing to run this controller, it's as if you can just take the dynamics, erase them completely, and write them as the dynamics of a double integrator.
Okay? Now you might want to not want to do that because it uses a lot of energy. It's uh, you know, it could even be that inverse could get big or something, right? It could be very large torques. Okay, but it's so tempting that this is basically what robotics did for 50 years. Right? And it's the reason that some, you know, that robots have have been limited, honestly. Is that there's, it's so tempting to be able to sort of write that form. Just to make the point here, let me switch to this code. Make that a lot bigger. So if I take the equations of motion, which we'll derive in a second here, of a single, of a double pendulum, okay, and I simulate, I forgot to open my mesh cap instance here. This is just the course uh, notebook, so you can just run this yourself. Okay, I'm going to take the dynamics of a double pendulum. We'll, I'll write that down in a second, okay, but that's just a standard two-link robot. Let's assume I have motors at both of the joints, okay? My claim is that if I have motors at both of the joints, then I can make that robot do anything I want. And, well, it's only two links. I can't make it act like a three-link robot. Uh, but I can make it do anything a two-link robot is capable of. So, for instance, I wrote a simple controller that basically took the two-link robot and I tried to make it act like a one-link robot. So I took the dynamics of the single pendulum and I said, act like that, okay? And that's just, you can just drop in and make it act like whatever you want, basically. And then, uh, let me simulate. Okay. Make, I can just convert the two-link robot into a one-link robot, effectively, with feedback. And even more, maybe more, is it more surprising? I don't know. I, I could have just chosen the gravity to be upside down, so I can make it an upside down two-link robot, right? And the math just all goes through, right? Because I can just apply torques and I can erase the dynamics and if put in whatever dynamics I want, and I've got a different robot, okay? So if I'm a walking robot, and it's, you know, it used to be kind of annoying that if you swing your leg forward, there's like a lot of momentum that goes there, and you have to worry about balance and stuff like that. You could cancel the dynamics of your swinging leg, impose potentially with a lot of, like a potentially a lot of torque required, a lot of energy required. I could impose a different dynamics and make it look like a, a simpler robot. Yes. Uh, it's it's. I think it's partly limited by the motors, but it's partly limited by the control philosophy, right? And that's one of the great things that's been happening now is that we're starting to see people break out of that. So like Atlas doing flips is a big deal to me because it, we're not uh, restricting ourselves in the same way. We're using stronger optimization tools to break out of that old mold. Yeah. That's true. That's true. But uh, you could pick an arbitrary, you could do like the you know, Ministry of Silly Walks, whatever. If you've got a fully actuated robot, then you can just program it in. Okay, the question is, are walking robots fully actuated? Okay, the answer, you know, spoiler alert, no, except in, this, in the case you have a big flat foot and you keep that flat foot attached to the ground and you pretend there's no degree of freedom between your foot and the ground, then you start acting like a fully actuated robot. That constrains the motions you can take, but then in that regime you can, you can make yourself a clockwork man, right? And that's how, we, that's how the field started. Okay, so, uh, I mean, you asked a question earlier about what happens if I have input limits, right? If I have torque limits, then it's possible I can't execute this controller, right? And it is true that different things that can break, um, I can break the feedback equivalence idea. With, for instance, input saturations. 
I said that u had to be between negative 10 and 10, can't be arbitrarily big, then depends if that controller ever goes near 11, right? If it stays low, for all the motions I care about, then those, that input saturation doesn't affect me. But if it starts asking me to produce torques I can't produce, that's going to run into problems. You can have constraints, like state constraints can interfere. We'll, talk, we'll examine a few different types of the constraints, but um, a type of state constraint might be that my robot hand can't be inside the table. Right? That would be a, a, an inequality constraint that is limiting the number of the cues that I can take because the world won't let me enter the table or my foot can't go below the ground. Okay? Um, model uncertainty. will complicate this, the, this derivation, but we'll, we'll see there's adaptive control approaches that can deal with it. Okay, so uh, input saturations actually by the generalized definition of underactuated would make a system underactuated, okay? Um, state constraints, it depends how they enter. It gets a little bit more subtle because they can be holonomic or non-holonomic, um, but, but that can also complicate the derivation. All of these things, basically make control interesting. They mean that you have to reason about the long-term consequences of your actions, right? When you're fully actuated, you can just erase things and act like clockwork. When, you're, when you have any of these limitations, you have to think about the long-term consequences of your actions. And that's where control gets rich. Okay, side note, just how many people have played with um, like RL on the standard gym environments? Yeah. So, some of them, you'll see things like Acrobat and Hopper and stuff like this. Um, you can make an under-actuated system. An Acrobat in the gym environment has one less actuator, so it's under-actuated. We'll see that. <coughs> we'll, use this, we'll study the Acrobat. If you, redu if you put very large torques and have no limit on bandwidth, then you can effectively turn an under actuated If there's any coupling, you can make it look fully actuated. So there's some subtlety in these definitions, okay? This is the rigorous definition, but you can make a, an underactuated system look almost fully actuated if you hack the parameters. So some of those gym environments drive me crazy because they don't capture the es essential dynamics of the robot that was, they were intended to model. They were kind of tuned a little bit to make learning curves look good, but they no longer resemble the physics that I, that I love. <laughs> um, some of them are great, but some of them are, are not look physical to me. Cool, okay. so. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Is that the rough definition? So now you know what underactuated means, yeah? So why, why is a humanoid, I, I said the foot thing, but maybe if I were to write the equations of motion for a humanoid, <clears throat> it would be very natural to use Q as all of my joint angles. But I also need some configuration that describes the location of my body in space, right? And even though I have many motors or uh, muscles, like more than the muscles than I have joints, but I'm still, so, so in that case, N is much bigger than M. I have lots of parallel actuation in my muscles and my tendons and everything, okay. But still, an, a humanoid is underactuated because when I'm, I can't immediately control the equations of motion of my center of mass. As soon as I jump through the air, assuming I don't have aerodynamic effects, I'm gonna take a ballistic trajectory. Nothing I can do with my M motors makes me can control those degrees of freedom. So that matrix is low rank. Again, it gets more subtle if you have a big foot that you're willing to say is bolted to the ground. That's the one case where an, a walking robot can look fully actuated. But really the study of walking robots is the study of underactuated robots. Yep. So a classic example of a fully actuated robot would be like a robotic arm that's bolted to a table. Okay, if I really, I don't have a degree of freedom between my table and my, my arm and the table, and I have joint, 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 motor, 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 then I can be fully actuated. That's where a lot of our best, you know, adaptive controllers and other things work beautifully. So it was natural for the community to, to sort of consider the regime where you could think of yourself as a, you know, one of your feet bolted to the ground. The cri there's criteria we'll, we'll learn about, which you can look at the center of pressure, basically, your instantaneous center of pressure. And if it's safely inside your foot, then that assumption is sort of reasonable. But it led us to build a lot of robots with big flat feet that kind of 
walk a little bit like this, right? Because you want to, you know, instantaneously keep yourself as if you're like a, a robot arm there and then a different robot arm here, and you can kind of use a lot of those control ideas. Okay, so I will, I was, I had a choose your own adventure here. I was, could either derive this or not. I will not. Um, okay, uh, but it's, I want you to know it's not scary. You won't have to do it in class. The software will always do it for you. That's, but you should know it's not scary. How would I have derived it? I could write a very simple equation that tells me where, so this is a, so what, what is the picture first? This is a double, the double pendulum I just showed you. L is the length of the link. M is a point mass. That's the simplest way to derive the equations of motion is you just assume there's no mass in the, along the length, only a point mass at each joint. Okay, so I called them the magnitude of that mass in kilograms, M1 and M2. The joint angles are theta 1, theta 2. I can write the kinematics. I can write the position of M1. It's just, you know, L sine theta, negative L cosine theta, basically. Very simple kinematics. I can do the same thing for M2. I can write the kinetic energy. It's just 1 half mv squared for M1, 1 half mv squared for M2. That's simple. I can write the potential energy. That's just, you know, MGH, MGH, simple. And then I can turn the crank of Lagrangian mechanics. I put that into my Lagrange equation. I take T minus U. I take some partial derivatives. And boop, what do I get out? I get this out, okay? This is the, sorry, that's the Lagrange mechanics, right? <clears throat> and what do you see here? Okay, so I, I called tau the torques at those joints. What is the form I'm seeing here? Okay, uh, I see Q double dot on this side. Q double dot actually always enters linearly. Every time you pop a robot in the top, you turn that crank, you're gonna see a, a dependence here on Q double dot that's linear, okay? And you're gonna see the torques on the other side that's linear, which is how I justify this form, okay? I, get, I could separate out my Q double dot. Turns out that I, mass is always positive, so the things that are in front of the Q double dot are always invertible, so I could take it over to this side, okay? The exact form of the equations, again, the software will do that for you, but you should know you could do it if you wanted to for two links. Three links, it's a little messy. Five links, I wouldn't recommend it, okay? But, uh, but it's not scary. Okay, and you should understand that it has this structure. One of the things about, so the software in the class is called Drake, um, but one of the things about the software, it's, it does simulation, like we just saw, but it actually also, because we're trying to open up the box and, uh, and see inside, it also has a symbolic engine, so you can actually generate the equations, the example code for the first chapter, you put the robot in and it'll symbolically tell you the equations of motion. You'll almost never, I mean, so some algorithms will require symbolic forms. You'll never, almost never want to print them. They get big fast, okay? But there's a symbolic engine that ex exposes all the structure of the equations uh, for our algorithms. Okay, so if you do that again and again, then what you'll see is a very important common structure, which is called the manipulator equations. So the thing I was just hemming and hawing about with the <clears throat> mass on one side, okay, we're gonna take yet one more level of specificity. Okay. This was more specific than that. This was more specific than that. And now I'm gonna write the manipulator equations, which is the form that captures most of the structure we care, care about. Okay, so this is the accelerations, positions, velocities you know. This is the mass matrix. This 
This is the Coriolis terms. This is the torque due to gravity, the generalized torque due to gravity change. This is the torque input, let's say. And this is sort of the actuation selector matrix. Every time you roll those equations through the, through the recipe, you'll see that they always fit in this form for almost every system you want. If you start putting in like flaps on an airfoil or something, you'll break it. But for, a, for rigid body mechanics, this is the form you'll see over and over again. <clears throat> There's one exception. I, I made a choice. So um, if you're working with quaternions, then you would use a slightly different notation. I would separate, I would not write q dot here, I would write the derivative of a quaternion slightly differently. We're just gonna avoid quaternions in underactuators, okay? We talk about it a lot in, in manipulation, you can't avoid it in manipulation, but here we'll just assume no quaternions in the state representation. It's easy to extend once you do. It's not, I'm not hiding anything, it just keeps the notation simpler. Okay, so one great thing about mass is that it's positive or non-negative, let's say, okay. And in this mass matrix form, sometimes also called the inertial matrix, okay, um, now this the generalization of that is that that's gonna be a positive definite matrix. You, in fact, the kinetic energy, the general form of the kinetic energy is gonna be one half Q dot transpose MQ U dot, that's one half mv squared in the matrix form, okay? To say that kinetic energy can never be negative is synonymous with saying that that matrix has to be positive definite. That's the definition of positive semi-definite, right? Not negative. So what that means, since this matrix is positive definite, I can always take the inverse. So I could always rewrite that equation as Q double dot equals M inverse Q negative C Q dot plus tau G plus B U. Okay. So that is the reason, that's the further justification that it could fit in this form. F2, in this case, is M inverse times B full stop. Moreover, since M, in, M is, in, is positive definite, M inverse is also you know, invertible, you can go back to, to M, okay? The condition of saying F2 is full row rank reduces to just whether B is full row rank. Yep. How does Q dot appear in F2? Um, yeah, it, in this, so in most cases it doesn't. Yeah, in most cases it doesn't. So that's more general than it needs to be. Yeah. That would be pretty weird to have it actually appear. I can't think of a simple case where that would appear. Cool? Yes. Ha, <laughs> yep. I got a little too happy. That's a gravity term. Thank you. Yep. Good, so um, it's a question of, that's a great question. Friction would typically appear as an additional term here, like a force of friction, if you will, or tau friction. So it probably wouldn't appear in front of, it would be an F1 for sure, 
but I don't know that it would enter into F2. If you had a um, torque dependent friction, you know, depending on your actuator model or something, I guess you could get there. Okay, so B tells you if your system's interesting. No, sorry, under actuated, right? You can just look at the matrix B. If B is full row rank, for instance, if you have an actuator for every one of your motors, a one-to-one -one correspondence, that's the simple case. B would just be the identity matrix. Or it could have a gear ratio or something in it, okay? But if B is full row rank, then you're fully actuated. Control can be easy. When B is low rank, you have to think harder about your dynamics. You can't just do feedback linearization. Your control actions have long-term consequences. Yeah? So I'll end with some stories, okay? Since I'm old now and I've seen the robots, you know, evolve. It's kind of maybe fun sometimes to, to tell you how that happened a little bit and how that relates to how that we're, why we're doing what we're doing here, okay? So um, when I got to MIT in 2000, I went down to the building of NE43, which was the leg laboratory at the time. Mark Rabert had already left and started the company Boston Dynamics down the street. It was a simulation company at the time. But there was a guy named Pete Dilworth that was building dinosaur robots. And that basically sealed my fate. I always wanted to do walking robots. But when I saw that, I was like, okay, drop everything. This is what I'm gonna do with my life. I just really liked Trudy, okay? Those are all little hobby servos. But Pete is a absolute design, you know, he just has something special about the aesthetics of these things, okay? But around that time, uh, this was like in 97 is when they announced this, but I remember the, uh, when I was a sitting in the leg lab at MIT and we had a visit from Honda and they came in and they're like, just so you know, we've been working on walking robots for 20 years behind the scenes. Look what we did, okay? And, um, and they, they came up with, they started showing the world this robot. This was P2, went on to P3, went on to Asimo, if you've seen Asimo. This is the slightly flat foot walker I talked about, but this was mind blowing. Mind, like absolutely, a, a game changer when this happened. We couldn't believe it. There was a lot of, you know, uh, we're obsolete kind of thinking, but it moved the field forward uh, in just fantastic ways, okay? But at the same time, um, this is sort of like, this is the fully actuated sort of view of the world, if you want. That's a little too simple. For, they're actually doing very advanced dynamics things, but. This is kind of what you get when you try to overpower your dynamics and act a little bit more like a robot arm. <clears throat> but around the same, I mean, earlier it happened, but I got introduced to it around the same time. I learned about these things called passive dynamic walkers. Okay, so these are passive dynamic walkers. This is like a beautiful gate of a robot just sort of taking a stroll down the, down the, through the park or something, right? And <clears throat> what is so compelling about that, and maybe you can see it, it has no motors, it has no controllers, it's powered only by gravity, and it's walking down a very small ramp, hence the name Passive Dynamic Walker, okay? So for me, this was sort of the beginning, was to see this, this dichotomy of the way we're making our fully, actu or, you know, our, our heavily actuated robots walk is so different than the way I perceive robots to, should walk, right? And somehow this captured it. And the lesson for me was don't try to erase your dynamics. Stop doing that, that's bad. Physics is good. We should be pushing and pulling the natural dynamics of our robot with minimal control. And that's the way we should be thinking about dynamics and control, right? And that's algebraically very, you know, a bit different, but sort of in the, in the rollouts, very different, right? Yeah. That's right. It the the philosophy came from that, but it but they are doing more advanced things to regulate their zero moment point. For instance, they're they're doing a lot of work to make sure that that assumption is good. I 
I think that's, that's fair. So basically, think of it as a hierarchy of controllers. Some of them are making that assumption true, and then the rest are leveraging that assumption. Yeah. It also requires, by the way, that your biggest motors are at your ankles, which seems a little backwards, right? Spot, for instance, its biggest motors are up at the hip. That seems to make a lot more sense. But you, a lot of those previous robots, the, the, big, the big motors are at the ankles. Um, before that time, the leg lab was already a thing. Uh, this was the, the beginning of the leg lab was actually about very dynamic robots. This is Mark Rabert, uh, who's the founder of Boston Dynamics. <clears throat> it started a lab at CMU originally, and then it moved to MIT. It was called the Leg Laboratory, and he made these pogo stick robots. We'll understand his controller, the dynamics of those systems, uh, in a future lecture. Okay, but this was the sort of the history of the leg lab before Honda showed up, right? was these very dynamic robots, which look very different than Asimo. They were throwing themselves through the air. They're very simple. In a weird way, running turned out to be a little easier than walking, because you could just throw yourself through the air and do sort of intermittent control. It's just a beautiful series of robots. Okay. And we have Asimo that came out, which is a very capable. I mean, it can dodge people and uh, it's a, still a beautiful, one of the best you know, engineered robots we've seen. Really, really good. It's super light and small. Beautiful machine. And now we have Atlas. And so just think about how amazing that transition, well, that transition specifically, but Such also the, the change from these very simple robots to sort of robots that can throw themselves through the air. And a lot of that is really going in, exploiting the dynamics, writing optimizations that can leverage these dynamics, and not trying to cancel yourself out. OK? Um, and it's like a different time now. I couldn't believe, you know, um, sorry, yeah, I think it's wisdom from the sky. But uh, no, the, so you know, now we're in a place where everybody thinks humanoid robots are a thing. I used to spend all my energy like explaining why I was working on humanoid robots, right? It's like. Uh, um, I'm not saying it's a product. I'm just saying it's a you know it's a scientific challenge. Humans have motor control systems that solve this problem that we don't know how to solve as engineers. That's a scientific challenge. I used to say that all the time, but now apparently it's going to be big. So fully justified. Um, no explanation necessary, right? And they're actually like I don't know. This just came out this week. Did you guys see this one? Oh my God, it's so good, right? It just you could almost see that in a factory, right? That's the first time I've seen one that's like, wow, that actually would be useful to have around. It's incredibly good. That's Pat Marion, who took under actuated a few years ago. Okay, this is the RL case. You know, oh my God, that's so good, right? This is now robots finally getting sort of to the limits of their performance, I think, right? And I, it's just, it's, it's such a good time. I love it. Okay, the cool thing is it's not just legs. You might, if you're, you might be like, oh my gosh, he's talked a lot about legs. I didn't come here to learn about legs. It's true in other fields too, right? So let me just tell you a quick version in, if you care about um, drones, let's say. All right, so what's sort of the moral equivalent the feedback linearization for an aircraft. Okay, when you stay in a low angle of attack and your airflow stays attached to your wing, then you have considerable control authority. Okay, and that's sort of the safe zone where we have a lot of control authority. Our flaps and you know ailerons and everything can have a significant authority over our pitch and the like. Okay, birds don't do that. Um, they don't restrict themselves to the small envelope. And the example that I like the best maybe is when they land on a perch, right? So they go into these severe post-stall maneuvers. There's, I like this picture, if you can see, there's like smoke trails there showing clear separation behind the wings. The airflow did not stay attached to the wings. They're in a regime that most people would call stalled and like you've lost control authority. But they do it all the time and they land on perches and it mostly works out pretty well, right? Beautiful stuff, right? So just to say that a little bit in pictures, right? If you're at a low angle of attack, you have good control, including over your 
control surfaces. When you start separating, you know, naively and in practice, you don't have the flow over your control surfaces, and there you don't, you've lost some control authority. Okay, that might be a velocity dependent D, maybe. <laughs> it's a little bit complicated, but uh, <clears throat> all right. And so I just got fascinated watching birds do these things, right? And so this is like a, an owl that was clearly baited with something at the camera, but uh, it's going a little slower than I remember. If you care about aerodynamics, then watch the leading edge feathers on this, this owl. This is a little grainy, okay? This is gonna watch right around there. It's gonna flip up. He's gonna be in sort of separated flow on his leading edge and does this sort of beautiful, beautiful landing. Separated flow right there. All right, you can find lots of these like on the Nature Channel, right? We started building airplanes that could do this. This was early underactuated. I tried to make the simplest airplanes possible that could do the same thing. This one didn't have a prop. It had one control surface. Okay, we shot it out of a cannon, but we made it land on a perch just by thinking about the nonlinear dynamics. And that was some of the early work sort of in this line of thinking. And it was similarly in a very post-stall aerodynamic regime, right? And we had airplanes that could sort of land on a perch whenever it drove through it. And now, again, we have like drone racing. This is this earlier this year, or I guess last year now. Um, and drones are now, you know, at co competition level human performance, right? They're ch champion level human performance for drones. We have robot controllers that are using perception, operating close to the limits of the vehicle, and this is just awesome, just awesome. Birds still have a number of things on us, right? They're way more efficient. The albatross can fly across the ocean on, you know, basically without flapping its wings. Drones don't have that yet. They can like dive bomb at 200 miles an hour and catch a smaller bird. Uh, I'm not sure we can do that yet. So there's still lessons from nature, but um, this is one of my favorite, I'll, and then I'll, I'll end, right? So um, this is a hummingbird, likes to feed uh, out of a feeder. The cool thing is, so did you see, it just looked like it was kind of hanging out there, right? It's actually doing a backstroke at like eight meters per second. You know, they, it, it's in a huge wind tunnel that's just blasting it with air, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm all good, you know? And it's, it's, it's amazing. Like, you could, they could change the airflow in all these different directions, and it's keeping its head rock steady. Boom, you know, like, no problem. All right, last one. Um, this is a fish. Same, uh, same fish three times. Well, this is maybe the early version of the fish, and the um, later version is the big one, okay? It's a rainbow trout. It's, we're looking down at, in a water tunnel. This is how a rainbow trout swims in a water tunnel. That's just a nan natural gait of the rainbow trout. We put a rock, we didn't, it was George Lauder at, and company at Harvard, put a rock in front of this. And the rock sheds vortices. And the rainbow trout changes its gait in order to adapt to those vortices. It's called a von Karman gait. It's pretty awesome. But this is the one that I just love, okay? So this is the, that rock, okay? Here we go. This fish is dead. There's a string making sure it doesn't go back caught in the grates, but watch what happens. That dead fish just swam upstream, right? Just because the mechanics of the body is designed to resonate with the vortices that it experiences in the world, turn the energy of those vortex streets into forward propulsion, no brain, gone. Uh, but it can still swim upstream. Okay, so that's dynamics. Dynamics is beautiful. We should master it, not cancel it out. See you next time.